All right, guys, thank you for joining us for this Black Hills Information Security webcast. We have Joff Thayer here. He's talking about Python PSUtil module exploring in Windows. Joff, take it away, buddy. Okay, I think I will. All right. Hi, everybody. I Look, I'm so glad you were here for the pre-show banter. And if you weren't, you missed out because it's probably the best part of the show today. Oh, I, did, I didn't mean to say that. All right. Uh, we're going to talk about the PSUtil module in Python. Uh, if you didn't know me before, um, I'm Joff Thayer. Uh, I've worked for Black Hills Information Security um, probably longer than most HR professionals would recommend. Um, I'm an anti-siphon instructor, uh, research dev, initial access ops, uh, unofficial title of the malware pit boss. Yeah, um, I, um, The meme game on Discord and the various channels whenever we present is always awesome. And I collect some of these graphics uh, from the memes that pop up. So, hey, you too could create a fun meme of Joff and uh, maybe even feature in um, one of my title slides uh, at one point. Uh, if you want, no copyright material, please. Uh, make sure you're original, right? All right, we're going to talk about the Python PSUtil module. Um, so what is this thing? First of all, the uh, Python... See, now I have to get serious. I don't, I don't like getting serious. <laughs> the Python... PSUtil module is a PyPI package. What, is, what does that mean? Uh, PyPI is the community agreed upon third-party package installation uh, website, if you like, or resource for uh, the Python community. Um, Ubuntu has done this weird thing lately, by the way, if you're an Ubuntu user, where they uh, moved away from using Python's tool uh, called pip to install packages, and now they want you to use apt install and they use like python dash package name i don't know why but that's what they do um python psutil is a third party package it is not built into python at all uh and what it is is a cross platform module for process and system information it um uh supposedly works well across linux windows mac os freebsd openbsd netbsd all the all the possible iterations of where you could run uh, Python. There is a version of PSUtil for both the um, uh, Python 2.7 major version of Python, as well as 3.6 and up. Now, if you come to my class, which I really hope you do, I will encourage you, encourage you very strongly to only develop in Python 3 these days, because Python 3 is the major release of Python today, the original Python 2 line of code were, is considered end of life as of uh, mid-2020. And so it is well and uh, truly time to move into the world of Python 3. In fact, it's past time to move into the world of Python 3. The scope of coverage for the PSUtil module um, it implements most functions covered by Unix-like tools. Notice I said Unix. Linux is just a variant of Unix, folks. Don't forget, PS, top, IO, top, LSOF, IF, config, netstat. So it actually has a scope that extends beyond just uh, process listing, Okay. Uh, it has a BSD3 clause license, and it's authored by an Italian gentleman by the name of Giampolo Rodola. Sorry, sir, if I have mispronounced your name, but that is the author of the PSUtil module. Okay. Why am I talking about this? And why are you here? Um, well, to go backwards in the order of questions, you're here because... You like us and you want to sit around and listen to me talk about Python things and maybe you get to blow off an hour or maybe an hour and a half of work and call it legitimate uh, learning time. Excellent. I love that, right? Now, why am I talking about this? Thank you for all the applause, love hearts and stuff. That's awesome. Um, I often do malware dev work under Windows, right? Um, I like to examine Windows process details during malware R&D efforts. I uh, know there are awesome tools like System Informer, uh, formerly called Process Hacker, Process Explorer, all of the suite of sysinternal stuff. But I just love the speed and utility of command line tools. Uh, and furthermore, kind of in association with that, 
I'm a Windows terminal user these days. I like PowerShell 7 when I'm developing on Windows. Uh, so like my first go-to place uh, if I'm working with a Windows desktop for development purposes is to whack Windows terminal on there, get download PowerShell 7 uh, from the GitHub repository, download the latest version of Python, and then start moving forward on that system, right? Now, I was doing all this uh, sort of, and the, the, the tool I'm going to talk about that surrounds PSUtil kind of came, well, it didn't kind of, it came out of me starting to uh, chase down Chromium process architecture, in particular Chrome, but also second to that, uh, the Edge browser. And um, it's Chrome is an interesting thing. I'm going to go on a little bit of a tangent here. Uh, Chrome or Chromium uh, uses an inner process communications abstraction library called Mojo M. I hope I said that right. I think Mojo M sounds better than Mojom. Um, anyway, this abstraction library allows the browser architecture in Chromium, uh, and that's whether you're using Edge, whether you're using Signal. Imagine that. Signal uses Chromium under the hood, right, in their architecture. Whether you're using Chrome and any other tool that decides to use the Chromium open source uh, project now, uh, uses this Mojo M under the hood in, for their inter-process communications. And the way that it is architected is the various processes or processes, if you like, have dedicated tasks. Uh, and then when you start up a browser, you start up Edge or you start Chrome, the dedicated tasks are specified on the command line of the process, right? You didn't know this, but this is partly what this talk is about, right? And they have a type and a utility subtype flag. Uh, and the various types, whether it's Chrome, whether it's Edge or whatever, are renderer, utility, GPU process, and crash pad handler. And then there's a couple of utility subtypes in the process architecture of uh, the browsers that are using the Chromium project. And, and these two are, are kind of interesting, storage.mojoM.storage service and network.mojoM.network service. In the latter category, the network.mojoM.network service is actually responsible um, for all of the network communications that are at least not cached uh, by, by the browser. And so the renderer processes in Chrome actually talk to the network process to ask for things from the network. And the network process is one of the dedicated processes that's part of the architecture, right? So since about 2021, some in the Windows context specifically, some but not all of the Chromium processes are protected under Windows. This applies both to the Chrome and the Edge browser. And the mitigations that are applied to the, the browser processes are provided by the Windows Process Threads API. And this is actually implemented really, really well. Um, the mitigations that are applied, particularly to the renderer and the GPU processes, which are the most highly targeted and attacked processes, are extensive. They are like ASLR, control flow guard, child process creation disabled, DEP, extension points disabled, restricted image loading, indirect branch prediction, prediction if it's supported by the hardware, right? Um, you know, shadow stack stuff, if it's supported by the hardware. This has actually gotten to be a really good defensive technology, right? In fact, if we dive into some of these control flow guard, child process creation, I think that's fairly obvious. Images restricted, that particular API on Windows restricts the type of executable, executable, images that can be mapped into the process. Furthermore, no low mandatory label or remote devices can map an image into that process. Guess what that is targeted at? It's targeted at process injection, right? Your Chromium architecture process that's a renderer or a GPU process is protected from that. Indirect branch protection with the hardware support protects you from hijacking the instruction pointer and changing the control flow in that process, right? Signatures restricted. 
will only allow Microsoft signed images to be loaded into that process. Right? Uh, when 32K direct system calls disabled, disables, particularly this is user DLL stuff, the user GDI function related system calls, right? With the exception of the GPU process, because it has to do that. So you can kind of see how the folks in Chromium have separated out these functional units of the browser into a storage service, a network service, a GPU service, and, and the renderer kind of stands alone and is very highly protected, right? And in between all that, that family of processes, right, what's happening is inter-process communication using IPC uh, in shared memory space. All right. And that has to happen because there is data that has to flow back and forward between the, the processes um, in the um, architecture. Right. Why does this matter? Well, it, you know, you're probably thinking to yourself right now, hey, Joff's talking about all this stuff because I bet he spent some time looking at it. And you would be right. Right. Hacking, if you hack a browser, hacking Chrome or Chromium, gives us access to some very interesting data today, right? Think about the world we live in, right? And this is stating the obvious, but we are doing cloud everything today. And cloud everything means we are interacting with our compute environment directly through the browser 99.9% .9 of the time. So if I get a hold of the browser and are able to intercept data in any form, I have a very powerful mechanism to give us access to some very powerful environmental controls in any enterprise, right? So we wanna mitigate attacks from both, uh, if we're a browser, from other operating system processes and from uh, each other inside of that family of architecture as well. We wanna make sure that we're mitigating attacks and we wanna mitigate attacks that are directly coming from the web. And those normally fall in the category of heap-based attacks where we have a whole bunch of JavaScript that's being thrown at the DOM in that browser in an attempt to break some data structure or write some code that we can then later on control the, the uh, instruction pointer somehow and point it at the, the machine code that we have put into the DOM from some sort of JavaScript or TypeScript entity, right? So the forms of attack can come from different directions. They can come from the operating system up, the internet down, right? And um, attacking, if you're looking at it from the operating system up, attacking a renderer or a GPU type process in the Chromium family is very, very difficult on Windows. I'm talking about Windows in particularly because of that process protection API that's wrapped around it. There's an unfortunate thing here in that attacking a network service process is actually easier because the architecture is forced to leave anything that has to interact directly with the operating system a little less protected, right? So I can open that network service process. I can potentially try to manipulate things in that process, right? Pretty cool stuff, right? So that was a little tangent and a, probably a little teaser, but I'm not gonna go any further than that. I'm gonna go back to PSUtil, but I was setting a context there so that you can understand why I got interested in having a little bit of command line support as I was doing some of that research. So PSUtil in the package from a Python perspective has a method in there called process underscore iter. And process underscore iter returns a Python iterable object, which yields back a process class instance. And that process class instance is created once, and then it is cached in memory by PSUtil. And in that process class instance are various attributes that we can retrieve from each individual process on the system. It's a really nice way of implementing it. I've got to give um, 
the uh, author uh, creds on this. This is this is really um, well done, right? So we use this iterable object. We get process classes back. We can loop through those, right? Um, you know, first to break it down just a little bit, what is a Python iterable object? Well, it's any object in Python, and Python has many objects. It's a fully object-oriented language that we can iterate over. And what does that mean? It means we can loop through that iterable object and retrieve individual atomic objects or atomic elements from that looping process, right? Down under the hood in Python, what that really means is we implement a method called double underscore iter or a method called get item. And that iter method returns an object containing another thing called a double underscore next double underscore method. And next gives you essentially the very next object as you're iterating or looping across this iterable object that's been returned. There is an atters argument to the process underscore iter method that give us various process attributes that we might be interested in. Now, we have to be a little bit careful here because with this package, the more attributes that we ask for, the longer in terms of real compute time it will take. Uh, and there's some reasons for that, which I'll, I'll talk about in, in the next slide or two, right? Some of the useful attributes are the name attribute, which is just the string text name, right? The process ID itself, the PID, the username, which is the process owner, the command line arguments, the actual command line arguments that the process was started with, and that was something I was interested in. The environment, which is all the environment variables of the process, memory information, which returns a named Python tuple of fields containing extra memory information about the process. And then of course, something like uh, num underbar threads, which gives you the number of individual threads running in a process. And if you're familiar with a little bit on the Windows architecture, a process on Windows is essentially just a container that's got lots of threads in it. And threads is where the actual action is happening. The threads are actually running the code and doing the things that your process needs to do. Some of the attributes returned by memory underbar info are um, quite useful. For example, Windows has RSS, which gives you the number in bytes uh, of bytes that uh, that particular process has allocated. It's an alias for uh, W set, or and that means working set, right? Working memory set. Uh, VMS, which is an alias for page file. That's the page file memory that is allocated in that process. Number of page faults. Uh, we've got the peak working set, the peak page pool. So it actually keeps some statistics for us, right? We've not only got the instantaneous page pool of memory and non-page pool of memory, we get the peak values as well uh, in these uh, process objects that are returned when we're iterating through processes. We get the peak page file as well as the page file. And we also get any private memory that might've been allocated uh, for that uh, process. So memory info gives us quite a lot of detailed information. There's another method as a part of the process class called memory maps. And memory underscore maps returns back a list of named tuples with process memory region information. Now under Windows in the PSUtil package, the memory maps method or function only returns two items. And that is the loaded module name and the memory size in bytes of that loaded module. And again, this is called RSS, uh, essentially the working set of memory for that particular DLL in that particular process, uh, which is useful, right? Um, in Linux, it gives much more detailed information. I don't have the full details on that, but the first implementation uh, of PSUtil uh, was more focused on Linux and has more functionality in the Linux space, in fact, than it does in the Windows space. Now, for those that are familiar with the Windows architecture, you may ask the question, hey, what's really happening behind the scenes 
with PSUtil as this memory maps and memory info functions on a particular process class run? What's going on? Well, there's really a couple of different APIs in the Windows foundational classes that are being called, right? Um, one of these is the process status API, and the other one is something uh, in the tool helper library called uh, create tool help 32 snapshot, essentially, which gives a process state snapshot for frozen moment in time, right? That we can then derive information from. So under the hood, essentially the C code that backs the PSUtil module, these are the APIs on, uh, on Windows uh, that, uh, that are actually being used, right? When we look at a list of pro processes on Windows, there are a couple of challenges that we can run into. Uh, we can raise an exception when we try to instantiate that process class as we're looping across this process iter. Commonly in Windows, the exceptions that we're going to raise are PSUtil, no such process, i.e. we, in the snapshot, see the process exists, but in the time that the snapshot was taken and the time that we actually try to access the attributes of that process in that process class, the process has died. It no longer exists. So that's going to be a no such process exception, right? We can also get an access denied, right? Because we might be running this process iteration as a regular Windows user. And as you well and truly know, there are system user processes. There are other user processes potentially in the operating system that we don't have privilege for to actually open that process and get information from. And make no mistake, when PSUtil is iterating across processes and retrieving this information with these methods, it has to actually use a Windows Open Process API call to get some of that information. And we're going to get an access denied when we cannot open that process object. We can also get a timeout expired, which is raised when waiting for a process to terminate within a specific timeout and that timeout period uh, elapse, elapses. Right, the most common exception that we're going to run into for iterating over processes is going to be access denied, right? We just cannot open that process to get the information out of it. All right, so looping back, my goals again, I like command line tools, right? I was working with Chrome and Chromium-based research. I was very interested in process command line arguments and loaded module information about particularly the Edge and Chrome processes. And I wanted a clear and unambiguous process listing readout so that I could see those details. Furthermore, my goal was I wanted to sort the loaded modules by their memory footprint and optionally display those loaded modules and the way I, I sorted them was from the largest memory footprint down to the smallest. And I also wanted some additional filtering options. And so with all of this in mind, having studied PSUtil, having been dissatisfied with commands like task list and the task manager and less dissatisfied with system informer, because let's not, you know, let's not sugarcoat that. Process Explorer and System Informer uh, are very, very useful tools, but they're not command line tools. I can't easily cut and paste from those tools. And I was after a command line tool. So I set about authoring a script called ps.py. Now, obviously it uses the psutil module. I had to use pip to install that. Uh, alternatively, I could have gone to the PyPI website and downloaded it. Um, I could have, um, uh, if I was on an Ubuntu operating system, which I wasn't, I could have tried using apt-get, that kind of stuff, right? I have some initial uh, additional modules I use. Two of these are built in to a standard Python installation. That would be pathlib and argparse. And then I wanted to put some pretty colors into the display 
So I chose to uh, pick up a module called Colorama, uh, which really is a very, very simple third-party module exclusively focused on using ANSI uh, color code display codes to uh, change the color of the output, right? Which is really nice. Then I 100% implemented all of my code in this ps.py script in a Python class, and I just called it psargs, which is probably something that my brain arbitrarily emitted at the time I started writing the script, right? So don't read in any meaning into that. I was like, oh, I got to call a class something. Oh, let's call it psargs, right? Um, and move forward, right? Well, before we go too far, let's do a little bit of teaching, right? Because what I do, uh, part of my job is an instructor for anti-siphon. So let's talk about the Python language elements we're actually using here. So we're using imported modules. We're using the built-in modules, pathlib and argparse. We're using these third-party modules or packages, if you like, called psutil and colorama. We're using the Python concepts of classes, attributes, and methods. And that's a fancy way of basically saying we're encapsulating functions and variables into an object, right? We're using format strings for printing the output. We're using for loops and some conditional logic. We're using dictionaries and lists in Python. We're using exception handling and we're using a few string methods like lower. And we're also using the sorted method as well as a concept called Lambda functions. So there's actually quite a, a vast array of various Python language features sort of crammed into this relatively small script. Um, when I write Python these days, I like to do it in the most efficient way that I can. And so I try to use a lot of the language features to raise that level of efficiency. Um, and that comes from experience writing the language. Now, Python classes, well, Python is a fully object-orientated language, right? Everything in Python is an object. What is an, what is an object or really what is a class? Well, a Python class is a syntactical blueprint for creating a Python object. A Python object, in other words, is basically an instance or an instantiation of a class. All objects in Python have attributes and methods associated with them. Well, a method is simply a function that's encapsulated within an object. Function comes from the, the, the concept of functional programming language. Every programming language that's ever been invented in the Van Neumann architecture on a computer is essentially a functional language-based concept because that's the way the architecture works, right? An attribute is simply a variable encapsulated within that object, right? A Python dictionary and a list. Well, a dictionary uh, is a data structure that's also known as a hash table. What does a dictionary do in Python? It stores items in memory as key value pairs. The key can be almost any object, but it's very commonly a string, like we'll quote Joff, for example, right? The value can also be almost any Python object, but it's quite commonly a string, a list, maybe a tuple. A tuple is just a grouping of Python objects, right? Since the keys are hashed, looking up data in a hash table or a dictionary, you can use those words interchangeably, is very, very fast and efficient, okay? What about a list? A list is a simpler data structure. All it does is stores the elements by an integer index, which are basically just memory pointers. A list can contain almost any Python object also, one nice feature about a list in Python is that we can sort data in a list using the sorted method or the list.sort method. Now, when we try to sort data in a Python list, you got to remember that the values we're sorting in that list must be considered comparable objects. In fact, in Python 3, Python actually enforces this. It actually says, Look, 
if you try to sort a list of Python objects and they are not comparable, in other words, I cannot say if this one is greater than this one or less than this one, then Python will throw an exception, right? Now, an easy way to get around that is often to just cast the object to a string, which you see that done quite often. What about exception handling? Well, Python, as it turns out, provides us exceptional exception handling. What is exception handling? Well, the modern computing architecture has something called exception handling built into the operating system today, which means when something unusual happens with a thread in a process, you can call another piece of code to handle the error. And most modern programming languages, Python included, provide us a way to catch any of those unusual conditions so that the script or the program, if you like, doesn't just break and crash. We can actually handle the unusual condition and go on to the next thing, right? In Python, we have both named exceptions and we have unnamed exceptions, right? The named exceptions, well, that's just RTFM. You go out, you read the documentation, find the names of those exceptions and catch them by name, or you can just catch the exception generically. And we definitely are using exception handling in this script. Command line arguments. My ps.py script also has the concept of command line arguments implemented. Now, before, as a Python programmer, before you consider going out and writing your own code to manage command line arguments, well, just don't. There is a built-in Python module that's been around for many years now called argparse. And argparse allows you to handle in a very uniform way any command line arguments that you need to pass into a script that you're writing. In this particular case, I implemented a command line argument to match a process name. I implemented a parameter to list loaded modules. I implemented a parameter to list command line information. And I implemented a parameter to even filter on command line information. And the argpad pod pause module, whew, that was a mouthful, allows me to do that fairly seamlessly with a simple syntax and it also builds the help for us dynamically, which is really, really cool. All right, so a little bit of Python. Here is the core of the script. It is a Python method in that PSArgs, um, in that PSArgs class, and the method is called run. And you will notice in this method that we have in the loop, which is about four lines down from the top of that method, we are calling psutil dot process underbar iter. We are passing the process underbar iter method a list of attributes we are interested in retrieving. And we are interested in retrieving the PID, the name, the command line, and the memory info information. Excuse me, get a sip of water. Then we are using some exception handling to grab the value of the PID, get the value of the, <laughs> excuse me, name, get the command line and get the memory info working set value. And we're immediately dividing it by 1024 because that value is expressed in bytes and I wanted to display it in megabytes, okay? Uh, slash slash in Python, that is called an integer division. It's called the floor operation. I wanted integer, I didn't want a floating point number. I don't need memory size in decimal points, right? I, I wanted a whole number. Right. Then we have a couple of conditional matches in about the middle of the screen. If self.procname and procname.lower is not in name.lower, what am I doing there? 
I am looking at a parameter that I passed into the object called proc name. And if that parameter is implemented or if it's got a value, I am testing it against the process name. In other words, this is the code that filters on process name. And if that condition succeeds, i.e. we are trying to filter on a, a process name and the process name doesn't match the name that I retrieved, I want to continue to the next iteration of the loop. And that's what a continue statement does in Python, goes up to that next iteration of the loop. So I'm not going to print anything. I've got another statement below it for filtering on command line parameters. And again, it's a very optimized logic if self.commandline and self.cmdline.lower not in join commandline.lower, why am I doing that? Well, command line information from the process object is returned to me as a Python list. And so I joined the list back into just one big string, and then I'm looking for that command line info in that string. If I don't find it, Again, I go to the next iteration of the loop. But that's only if I'm specifying those filtering options. Okay? So it's kind of clever logic, right? Then at the very bottom of the screen, we're simply printing out all those details. We're printing out the process name, the PID, the memory footprint, um, just as is, and then we're resetting all that style information. We're using a format string to do that, using a Python concept actually called an F string, F as in Fred, okay? And we're using Colorama to put in some style information, i.e. bright font, particular colors, red for the PID, green for the memory size, et cetera, right? And printing those details on the screen. Now, of course, I said we had some additional information here as well that we could print. If we want to print command line, we need to call a method to do so. So I've got a method called print command line args. Also, if we want to print the loaded modules, we actually have to have another method to do that for that particular process object. And I call this one print under bar loaded underscore modules, right? And so I also wrap these in a exception handler just in case they fail. And I'm testing if the print CMD attribute is specified in the class, if the print modules attribute is specified in the class, because if they're not, I am not going to print this information, right? So that's how all of that works. Printing the loaded modules. This is where it gets kind of fun. Here we're using a Python feature called a Lambda function to impact the sort order. My goal, as stated above, was to print the loaded modules by the largest memory footprint first. So I needed to sort by the process memory information attribute called RSS. And in fact, it's the, sorry, it's the process memory map thread, module, not thread, wow, try that again, attribute called RSS. So I have a, a little more complex logic here that shows me looping through the sorted list of modules and sorting by that RSS value in reverse so that I get the DLL name essentially and its memory footprint printed out in a nice orderly fashion. And it took me a little bit of while to work out that logic just right so it wouldn't crash and it would give me the right information and also put in a pretty color as well. In this case, I used magenta uh, to display that information. Finally, in the main part of the script, there are two main sections to this. One is accept the command line arguments. And the second part of this is to create an instance of the PS args class with all of the provided parameters. And that's it. That's the main part of the script. It's not particularly complex other than it is accepting those parameters using the argparse module to define the different parameters that I want uh, and then uh, calling that uh, psargs class uh, and you know running the process uh, listing.
hey, guess what? It's demo time. Yes, it's demo time. But first of all, before we talk about the demo, I uh, hope I did this right. I made this project because it's a relatively simplistic project. I made it public on GitHub. It's there for you to download if you want uh, to study as a Python artifact. So feel free to go to uh, github.com, yoda66 slash ps, uh, and you can download the, the script. Uh, and in addition to this, um, I believe that uh, uh, Deb, uh, my good friend Deb, is going to share a PDF of the slides as well, uh, which is totally awesome. Um, so having said that, let me pull up the uh, demo. All right. So... Hopefully everybody can see this uh, on the screen. Actually, it doesn't look like I'm sharing the right stuff. Hold on. Let me go back to, I am screen sharing. All right, can everybody see uh, what looks like a Windows PowerShell command prompt? If I go to Discord and see what everybody's doing. Amy. All right. So here's my script. It's called ps.py. Like one of the guys who's in the back room or whatever, you can stop me if I'm not showing the right thing. Uh, anyway. uh, Jeff, yes. I do not see the thing that you should be showing. Okay, thank you. See, I knew somebody would stop me <laughs> later. Um, anyway, all right. Uh, let me uh, go back to um, stopping the screen share uh, and uh, sharing the right thing. Um, it would help to share the right thing, right? Uh, here we go. Share screen. And we will share PS demo. All right, excellent. Can you now see what looks like a Windows terminal? And perfect. It's got... perfect. Yeah, well, great. Thank you, Debs. Good job. All right, cool. So here's my ps.py script. Um, it's all the stuff I talked about. Um, I pretty much broke that out in the slideshow. Uh, and you can see here, um, if I just run python.exe on my Windows system, it's a Python installation, right? Um, I got the, uh, I actually used the app store for this particular VM and I got Python 3.11.8 installed, right? Control Z and hit enter will get us out of that. So I can now do python.exe ps.py and actually give it help, right? And you will see, uh, I, I, I gave myself credit now since I wrote the slides because I thought, well, it might be good to give myself credit. Uh, and you will see the, uh, the banner and then you'll see all the help options. So if you just run this thing without any command line arguments, right? Look at that. It's going to show you a process listing, just like I said it would, right? On your system. And it's going to give you the PID in nice red color. It's going to give you the number of bytes that that process is consuming in a green color. But wait, there is more, right? So let's go back. We can filter on a process name. So we can say, hey, I want to filter just on Chrome, right? And now it will show you just the processes that are running as Chrome.exe. Awesome. But wait, there is a little bit more. Hey, I want to list the command line parameters of those Chrome processes. And you get an output with Chrome.exe and you get a relatively well formatted command line parameters of all that Chrome.exe is using for each of the family of the Chromium processes that uh, you might be interested in. Now, if you're me and you're like in the middle of doing some Chromium research, you're like, well, I actually want to filter on a command line parameter. I want to get any command line parameter that contains the word storage. And we can actually do that. And we see that we just get the storage.mojom.storage service. Or maybe I'm interested in things that only contain GPU. And then we get the GPU um, process, right? Or maybe we want to take it a little bit further. And I want to see all of the modules that the GPU process of Chrome has loaded. So I put in my flag called LM. And not only do I get the command line parameters, you see it scrolled off the screen, I get the loaded modules sorted by memory size. Now, you probably, if you've ever studied the browser, 
we'll realize that Chrome.dll is the largest loaded module of Chrome because it is effectively the entirety of the Chrome code. Uh, and that is a 230 megabyte uh, memory footprint on Chrome, right? Here's another interesting, completely trivial side fact about this little project I was involved with. Um, and that is, if you download all of the Chromium source and you compile it, it will consume, once it's finished compiling, about 100 gig, that's gig, of disk space. And it will take, depending on the system you compile it on, over 24 hours to compile. Uh, which I found to be quite interesting. Uh, but I wanted to compile Chrome for fun and giggles because I was interested in some of the things that it was doing, all right? So there's uh, there's some of that, right? Um, and you can filter on anything you want. Let's see if Edge is running. All right, see, there's MS Edge. We can list the loaded modules in Edge, right? You see all sorts of things in there and um, have fun accordingly. Right. All right. Let's stop that share. I'm going to share back um, slides. All right. Um, and uh, that brings us to 1.46 p.m. Eastern time. Sorry, 1.47. Um, if you have any questions, you're welcome to ask them. It's really me just demoing some of the work that I've done and talking a little bit about the Chromium research. You're 100 percent welcome to go download uh, the uh, process listing Python script. And what I really would love you to do is go visit the Anti-Siphon Training website and join me for my next uh, Python class uh, live uh, because I'd love to be able to try to teach you how to program in Python, right? Um, so that's, uh, that's part of my uh, promotion here. And we do have an on-demand class as well in Python if uh, time is uh, a challenge for you and you'd prefer to go with the on-demand uh, version. So with that, let me pause for questions and what do we call it? I guess we'll call it post-show banter. Post-show banter. Well done, Jop. Well you. done. You were wondering if you'd had a half an hour worth of material, so. Well, oh, look, well done, I made it 50. to like 48 minutes. That's you you know, not bad. Not bad. All right. How do I use Python in Rust? What's your first question? How do I use Python in Rust? Mm -hmm. I'll tell you when I've studied enough Rust to answer the question. Is <laughs> my answer <laughs> to nice. that? Um, I am looking at Rust, by the way. I think Rust is uh, an interesting language. Um, it, you know, when it comes to different programming languages in the uh, information security space, whether it's offensive, defensive, whatever, um, use the right tool for the right job is my advice to everybody. And you kind of have to study that um, a little bit, right? Um, you know, C Sharp for, is a great example for example, on the Windows desktop because you get all the .NET API, for example. Golang is fantastic. It's good multi-platform language is very fast because of the concurrency features of Golang is it's very fast multi-threaded. Um, you know, Rust is a compiled language without some of Golang's, as near as I can tell, without some of Golang's baggage in terms of the memory management features that Golang brings along. And that makes it kind of an interesting language in and of itself. Um, one of the, um, you know, this is like a general answer to the question, but one of the um, challenges that we have with Python a lot uh, is dependencies. Uh, Python moves and changes over time. Uh, and packages and module dependencies can and maintenance can sometimes be a challenge. But the flip side of that is with the pro Python programming language, if you want to create a very highly functional proof of concept to demonstrate or even put in production some concept very, very quickly, it's an extraordinarily efficient language for doing that, right? But you won't quite get performance out of it, right? So you do have, you always have trade-offs. You get a lot of very high level constructs to the language that enable you to do things quickly and do things well, the trade-off is performance and some of the maintainability side of it. So it's always one of these games, picking the right tool. So. Well done. Zach, do you have any questions from Zoom or do we handle both of, both of those? Yeah, there wasn't really any, Not any from Zoom. Mm -hmm. okay. 
Awesome. 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 Any questions? If we missed some, go ahead and, and post them again. And we would love to have Joff uh, create an answer, make up an answer, uh, or give an actual, actual make, make up an answer. <laughs> Yeah, I'll just make up an answer. Make up an answer. I, I can give you opinion. Opinions, right? Everybody. Oh, has. Yes, exactly. Uh, Loki said there was a question on filtering by module loaded. I think that would be a version two feature that one. Um, I think that is a great suggestion. And I think uh, filtering by module loaded. Um, uh, if you actually go to the repo and you uh, download it and you want to do a pull request and implement that, Feel free to do so. I will. Uh, I will integrate that code. Um, so um, yeah, I cool. think that's a good good suggestion. All right. Noel Moniker says, "How do you go about moving a project from command line only in Python to implementing a GUI?" Um. So that's a loaded question. I think um, in, in the context of Python, if I was implementing um, a GUI, so to speak. I would probably use um, a Python web framework and and lean on the um, uh, on the on the web side uh, of Python and and there's a lot of reasons for that. Uh, a web framework in Python is going to give you um, a lot of extra middleware to help you with things like session management, cookie management, um, security features, that kind of stuff. Um, there are Python frameworks out there. Django was one of them that's been around for many, many years. Um, there's probably some others. Um, but in terms of GUI, I, um, if you were going for traditional Windows desktop, uh, API, I, I wouldn't use Python for that. I just, I just wouldn't, that would be painful. Um, would so, be painful. Yeah. yes. Yeah. I think most Python GUIs are a pain in the butt is what someone just wrote. So yeah, I, I tend to agree. Um, mm -hmm. go, go down the web, um, go mm -hmm. down the web direction. Right. So, Job, you uh, have an intro to Python class. There's a question about um, how about a more advanced Python class, Python for pen testing, or Python. So for that's that's a uh, that's a really great question, and um, I'd love to do that. I'm really struggling right now uh, with um, trying to to see if I can possibly replicate myself because uh, <laughs> the um, I want to write an AI class right now. I want to write a more advanced Python class, and I want to write a more advanced malware development class. And I'm just trying to work out which to choose first. Just one uh, job. Yeah, there's only one of me, yes. uh, and I'm trying to trying to work out the things. So just use AI to write a <laughs> Python like malware script yeah. or AI something, class, right? Yeah. Um, uh, Locky. Uh, Hakanin, I, I guess you say that, uh, put it to a survey. I think that's an excellent uh, suggestion. Um, I'm very, very tempted. Um, and let me just put this out there right now for everybody listening. I don't know how many we've got on the webcast right now, but um, I'm very tempted to write a four hour class of um, uh, uh, AI concepts in information security. Um, that's kind of the next one on my list, um, I think. So. I guess yeah, you I think do. that would be a good topic. Yeah. Thank you for the uh for the the show, uh the show of uh admiration, <laughs> love and stuff. Oh, that's awesome. I, I love to see yes. this. Thing. I want more of Joff. You just need to Michael Keaton it in multiplicity, just you know, copy yourself. Yeah, disco, look at that. Create your own LLM model to make your <laughs> life work. Well, if there was a way to plug a USB cable in my brain and just automatically extract a <laughs> Joff language model, I would love to do that. That would be uh, terrifying. <laughs> <laughs> Deb, for one, is scared. I just know um, you really well, my friends. So. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, all right. But look, yeah. uh, I, um, I, I just want to say this out loud. Uh, I mean, if it's not obvious, I absolutely love presenting and teaching. It is something that I really, really get a big, big kick out of um, mm -hmm. and being able to uh, communicate with you effectively. At least I hope that I'm doing that and be able to teach effectively uh, is something at my point in my career. And and I'll try not to say age word, but um, I really, really love doing. So I'm going to do more of it if I can. You're so good at it. We were in backstage just like Zach, you were like, man, he's so fantastic. Like he's engaging and he's, his pacing's good. And your transition from your slides to the demo was just like seamless. Yeah, you can tell that you really love what you do. 
Yeah, it's my first time watching you uh, do any type of training. So I was like, man, like you're just like really entertaining. And mm -hmm. yeah, like that's a very engaging. And everybody in the chat was just like following along and engaging along with you. Yeah. So it, it was just like such a cool experience all around. And like you bring that, you know, you bring kind of that to the table. You bring that like yeah. atmosphere. And that's just oh, again, man. really cool to see. Zach, that is high price. I, re I really appreciate that. We yeah. love Doc. Yes. Um, All right. Any more questions? Last chance. We will. We have a couple more minutes to ask Joff any question. It can be Python related. It can be Koala related. <laughs> he has a band that he plays in. Any any questions? But I'm not that? doing anything else, right? Ted? Yeah. That's, why aren't you creating other classes? I don't understand. Yeah. <laughs> I can't wait um, for the killer Koala Python script, though. That's right. Whatever yeah. that's going to be. Hey, yeah. thanks. And for those of you who missed uh, pre-show banter, it was it was amazing to, today. Um, <laughs> we we're just on fire. Um, it was but, a lot of fun. So but, a lot uh, of yeah. uh, somebody wanted a link to my class again. Yep. I don't know who wants to yep. paste that. Zach's um, on it. Zach's and just, on uh, it. just also everybody, I know that you're all talking about me and I love that. Uh, you know, my head's growing <laughs> 10 times the size it already is. And it's a big head, believe me. Um, uh, you know, show some appreciation for content community here at Black Hills. I mean, Deb and the team, the AV guys, uh, er just everybody that does this, um, they, they give us a platform to speak from. And I, I really, really appreciate it. And um, we, we have some really hardworking, great people here. So yeah, that is the best job for sure. We love it. We don't know what else to do with our, our lives. This is, <laughs> this is what we, if we could choose to do anything, we would do this. So yeah. it is just the best. We were talking about that backstage as well. <laughs> how we blessed were. we are to be here. Yeah. All right. Thanks everybody. Go All back right. to work. Wait, Thank you. wait yeah. I have one final question. <laughs> Joff, if you could sum up the last 57 minutes of your life, what is the one final thought that you would like everyone to take away? The last 57 minutes <laughs> of my life. Um, I, it's hard to know how to take that, Deb. Is right? it the last 57 minutes of my life, <laughs> as in I just died? <laughs> no. Or is it that? <laughs> I'm a little worried. Now. However you want to take it. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, it's... um. It's it's bring bring wow so hard to say. Um, never stop learning first of all, and um, you know talk to as many people as you can in this community and never stop growing and bring these concepts together. Don't you know? Just good enough is never good enough. If you're going to be um, excellent at your job and excellent in the information security industry in particular, which is very very challenging then you have to it, it, you have to be passionate about it that's what i would say about the last 57 minutes hmm. and you did you, that was you you were passionate about what you were teaching so thank you so much thank you to the 410 of you who stuck around and uh we just love showing up every thursday at one o'clock eastern time show up at 12 30 because there's pre-show banter and we just talk about nothing and talk with you and talk about hack it so if you were here well, before you leave, put Hackett into the chat and we will count you for this being one of your webcasts that you attended. And Yay. I think that's it. That's you did it. learn something and you get like what points yeah. or something. What is that? You do. Happen? Yeah. Some, awesome. some fun thing that we're going to send you. We were like, maybe pizza. I don't know. Probably not. But wow. Yeah. I don't need that. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you guys so much for showing up. All right, Ryan, you, kill man. it. Kill it, fire, Ryan. Fire. Kill it.